And welcome back to Stories from the River. We are here in the midst of a brand new series recapping World Business Forum New York City 2023. I'm sitting here with Heather Greenwood, Director of the Memory Maker Experience at the River, and Brian Dekelnik, our Senior Director of Supply Chain here at the River, both return guests to the pod. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so we're doing something fun and a little bit different. We just got back from New York City uh, for our second year in a row at World Business Forum. So we're just going to take each speaker that we, we really heard and listened to and really unpack what they talked about. So this episode is about Will Ghidorra. Welcome to Stories from the River, a show in which we go behind the scenes at Broad River Retail. Initial reactions, like what were you expecting about Will? And then kind of how, what was your like leaving impression? Heather, we'll just st- start with you and then we'll go to Brian. Um, I feel embarrassed to say this, but walking in, I didn't have any expectations. Um, it was a name I didn't really know. Then when I see he's a restauranteur, I think, yeah, I don't know how much I'm going to have in common with this speaker. I was sitting with Manny and I know both of us were like, okay, what, what do you think this is going to be about? We had no idea. Walking away from me, hands down, one of the most impactful people that we saw. Um, experience is vitally important to me and kind of how I've grown up through Nordstrom and now Broad River Retail. And so just listening to Will talk about exceptional experiences, talking about impacts on people and purpose blew me away. Um, reading my notes again blows me away. So happy we saw him and just thankful for the experience. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Brian, what about you? Uh, so I'll say, Heather, you shouldn't feel embarrassed because I was under very much the same situation, didn't really know much about him. I knew he was a rest- restaurant here. Um, kind of he talk a lot about just uh, hospitality and service. So I, I knew it kind of relate to what we try to do here at Broad River. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe I'd heard his name. I'd heard the name of his book, Unreasonable Hospitality, but I ne- never really dug in. I've not watched his Netflix mm-hmm. sh- show, which... Uh, is out there. So we'll put a link to the Netflix show that, that Lynn shared with us. And I, I need to make sure to watch that. It was the, the seven days before the reopening of his restaurant, I think is what she said. So I've got several pages of notes. Let's dig right in. Let's just talk about like his, his initial like background and how he kind of got into the, like trying to become one of the top 50 restaurants in the world. And, and like the, or what he, what he started off with in telling his story, Brian, what about you? Uh, yeah. So a uh, real powerful story, obviously. Um, I think one of the fr- my favorite things he said, uh, adversity is a power- powerful thing to waste, mm-hmm. uh, kind of uh, reminiscent of the uh, Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste, yeah. right? But that's how we grow, right? We grow through adversity and our learnings from adversity. So, I mean, that, I mean, that was like almost right off the bat there. Um, I think really set the tone for his entire entire presentation and speech. Yeah, it's um, a little bit counterculture. Like he was like, you know, hey, he was saying, they, they don't dismiss competitiveness. Mm-hmm. He said, I got angry. Because uh, I think this was when they just came out and they were ranked number 50 restaurant. And he went, he was at the, the big award show uh, for the top restaurants in the world. And he thought he was going to be settled in for the long evening. And then he was the first one to get announced. And like, you would think like, hey, you made top 50 restaurants in the world. But he was like really mad about it. And, and but he said, look, uh, and to your point, his dad gave him that quote. He said, adversity is a terrible thing to waste is what he said his dad said to him. And so I thought that was, that was he said it can, adversity can drive our competitiveness. So if you can channel it for good, it can be put to good use. And we'll hear more about like where they end up from number 50, which is a great accolade in and of itself and how they bridge the gap from 50 to one. But what was your take, uh, Heather? You know, we talked a lot about anger and competition fueling you. And a lot of times in the world today, we think anger is a bad thing or being too competitive or taking things too seriously. And I think of he really told that story of how it fueled him and he could have went away and been happy with 50 or he could have went away and been upset and didn't do anything about it. But what he did was to ask himself the question, how can I make an impact? Mm -hmm. And he took that and used that as a driver to start thinking about how can he make a difference? How can he do something that leaves a mark on people and leaves people better than he found them. Yeah, he, he was not bound by, you, you know, just like normalcy things in the world. Like his his dad, he said, gave him a, another fatherly advice thing that we gleaned from the, the talk. His dad gave him a paperweight that said, what would you attempt mm. if you knew you couldn't fail? And so that just like untethered him from like this fear of failure and said, okay, I'm going to go play all out. You know, I'm going to go 
I'm going to get angry a little bit and I'm going to set some really big goals that are going to scare the crap out of me, but I'm not going to be tethered by failure. Mm -hmm. And then he comes up with this phrase, you know, we hear like this phrase hospitality. And he said, no, you know, my chefs are unreasonable in the kitchen. I'm not a chef and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not like maybe professional athletes are unreasonable in their approach of how they practice and prepare. And I'm not a professional athlete. But what I, he said, I have a superpower mm-hmm. about hospitality and I'm going to go take that and be unreasonable in my hospitality. And that was the title of his book too. So unpack, uh, and he talks about being unreasonable in the pursuit of people. So like Heather, unpack that a little bit. I know you're such a people driven leader. Um, what, did, what does that mean to you? You know, that's one of my favorite things that he talked about. He talk, talked about teaching your team to be better people. And so as Will goes through his stories, A, there, there's a guest facing piece of it, right? Ultimately, they were there to elevate the experience of the guest. But really in doing that, he empowered his people. Mm-hmm. And what was unreasonable, I think for me, in the end of it was just how he cared for those people, whether it be the bus boy, mm-hmm. whether it be the waiter, whether it be the guest who's coming to New York City for the very first time and experiencing snow. I think of all of that. He talked about as the leader explaining the what and the why. And so I think about those critical moments that we're with people in our company, it might be a daily connection in our stores or a team meeting, but in those moments, how am I as a leader helping people become better? There's a lot to unpack there. So I think I want to, before I go into the, all the people he befriends up and down the chain and democratizes like brainstorming, you talked about, we have a daily connection, but Brian, he talked about like a daily huddle. Um, what did you hear when he said the daily huddle? Like, this is something common in restaurants. Yeah, you know, they have a, 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 a pre meal, you know, uh, uh, daily huddle. What you, what, what, what was your takeaway on that? Yeah, I think, and you know, you see that in our stores too, right? They always have the, the, uh, the, the meeting before the stores open, you know, and I think it just really gets everyone aligned on a vision of what they're going to do that day. Um, how they can support each other. Um, you know, he made the comment, involve people and in how you want to get, how you get to where you want to be. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's a lot easier to get where you want to be if everyone is moving in the same direction, mm-hmm. as opposed to having to drag them there or, or, um, you know, everyone's moving in different directions and trying to, you know, hurt them there. Right. Uh, get everyone involved, get everyone moving in the same direction and you'll get to where you want to go a lot quicker. It's almost like getting you, it's like a daily check-in. It's just getting fired up. I, I kind of, my takeaway was like, should we be doing that in our organizationally? Should we pull all our whole leadership together, you know, for a quick five minute, like, hey, what, what's going on today? And, and um, you know, the what and the why and unpack that. So anyways, just get your brain thinking about certain things like that. And I know some of our leaders already do that with their teams. And I think he really talked about, I'm sorry, Charlie. Yeah, go ahead. Not wasting that moment, mm-hmm. you know? So often we think if we do it and we do it every day, oh my gosh, are they kind of sick of hearing my message? but don't waste those moments. And what are you leaving them with? And how are you motivating and inspiring? And don't just let it be another meeting, Mm -hmm. but let it be a moment of inspiration for your team. But also he said repetition matters. You're going to get sick of hearing him say the exact same thing every, I think that's that unreasonableness. Mm -hmm. Like he's just going to drive, like this is the thing that's important to us. However, you talked about the brainstorming and, and, you know, like he talks about being friends with the bus boys and bringing everyone in. He had a way of like, like brainstorming and, and ideating. And, and was it just like the leadership team or was it, who was involved in that, Heather? He talks about bringing everyone to the table. No matter what your role is inside of his restaurant, everybody comes to the table to brainstorm. Whether you be the bus boy or you are the chef, yeah. everyone's voice matters and everybody comes to that table as an empowered to share their feedback. Yeah. And Brian, I know you love math and statistics. And so when they brought everyone in, like it wasn't like just a aimless customer journey like session. It was pretty, it had some intentionality and some numbers to it. Like what, what specifics do you recall about the customer journey mapping that they did? Yeah. So they, I know you said they, um, you know, they set aside, aside some time uh, one day, spent, you know, three and a half, four hours uh, just talking about the different touch points, every identifying every touch point along the way in a customer journey. Right. And I think they started out with, you know, 20 or 30 and he says like, yeah, but there's more. And then it was like 50 or 60. And he's like, yeah, but there's more. And they wound up like 120 touch points and how you can make each one of those touch points special for the guest, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, making the ordinary extraordinary and creating a memorable uh, experience for them. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think that's where we get into like the peak moment uh, that we learned about from the power of moments, right? The, the book there right. uh, that, we, that we read. And so um, maybe he had read that book and, and took that, but 
I mean, I would never have thought like there's 120 touch points. And you think about like how many touch points in a shopping journey when you're coming to buy furniture. Like if we really map that out, we might have 300, 400, 1,000 touch points mm-hmm. and opportunities to like, hey, how can we create a, a, a flagship moment at every single one? Uh, and so, but it wasn't just the leaders on the team. Like you said, it was like everyone coming together and like going through every single one. And then he had this phrase about generosity. Do you remember what he said there, uh, Heather? I don't know if I have that well, one. Well, it's, it's, I think it was like this reciprocity of generosity when you're generous to someone. This was like almost the marketing they did. He said, it doesn't uh, come back equal to you. Mm-hmm. It says generosity begets generosity, not symmetrically, asymmetrically. And so like if you do a small thing for someone, it has like just a big impact on them and they might go tell 10 people or 20 people. And, and like, then now they're your spokespeople, but the, it's, it's like, um, uh, you know, it's, you take these seemingly meaningless touch points that people will never forget. And, and like they're collecting touch points or they're collecting memories in the store, which I thought was, was really cool. And it's like just really small enhancements to the, the least likely touch point gets the biggest impact. Uh, he even had this phrase that, that I wrote down. It said, raindrops make oceans. And so I, I think that that was really cool where we get into like these moments that like really stand out. Moments of tension are the moments to like lean in. So w- what that might be is like when something goes wrong, right? And so w- what were some of the examples that he said something could go wrong and that w- how they reversed it? Do you guys have uh, recall what he talked about there? You know, he talks a lot about the these one size one size fits one gestures, mm-hmm. and so it's making it specific. So he really talked about being present. You won't hear those things if you aren't being present in the moment. So hearing what the couple at the table is celebrating or the family eating dinner. But he said it's those bad experiences that are actually the best one when there is a mistake. Mm-hmm. How do they come back from that mistake means even more. And in his experience, those are some of the best ones. And those are then customers that come back for life or they see again, yes, they made a mistake and owning it is the first thing. But then how do we come back from it is even more important. Yeah. Brian, were you challenged by that? Like, I mean, we stumble and stub our toe all the time, you know, unintentionally in our business. And to me, it like, just like he, he said, customers will be forgiving it, based off how you respond to that and, and own it, what, what was your response or how did you internalize that? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think that's very true, right? I mean, if everyone has a great experience all the time, you almost come to expect it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you can recover from when you failed, I, I mean, it, it, the response to that is just, it, it's, it's enormous, right? Because mm-hmm. I think you can, you know, first acknowledge you failed, right? Sorry, we failed you. Um, but then going above and beyond, to, to recover um, is really gonna set the, you know, it's gonna be the lasting imprint for, for the customer. And having preparation for, you know, like you talk about being present and he talked about the story where he heard uh, the, the folks talking about they had done everything in the city, but they didn't get a, like a hot dog off the street and how he was walking around. So he, so he heard them and then he, uh, what, do you remember that story? Yeah. Do you want to tell it? Yeah. Okay. So he just happened to be helping clearing tables in the restaurant. They were slammed. And so he went out to help clear tables. And it was a group of people. And this was their first time in New York City, quite possibly maybe their last visit to New York City. And they were just talking amongst themselves. Man, we've had some of the greatest food we've ever had. But you know the one thing I missed? Like a New York City vendor cart hot dog. And he heard it from across the restaurant or wherever he was. And he made it his mission. They were going to have that experience and they were going to leave New York City having it. So he went out to a local vendor to hot dog cart and he brought in a New York City hot dog. He had his chef kind of dice it up, get it ready to go. And he delivered it to them saying, hey, I want you to leave with this experience now that you've had all the best food in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want you to miss it. I'll tell you uh, my favorite part of that story. Um, so I think he he said something like, you know, serving a New York City hot dog in a restaurant like that, it's, it, it's a cardinal sin, right? He's like, but I told the chef, this is important to me. And that's yes. all he had to say, right? Because if it's important to you, then it's important to me. Mm-hmm. End of conversation. Yeah, the chef was like, ah, boss, we're, <laughs> come on. I'm not serving this street hot dog in a re- 11 Madison Park. We're not, we're top 50 restaurant in the world. We're not doing that, he said. He's, uh, they're going back and forth. He goes, at the end of the day, you got to say, this is important to me because he had had that trust. So the chef did dress it up. I mean, it was dressed up and sliced up and gave him that, that great experience. Okay. So 
you know, it's one thing like to hear that and cause you have one restaurant, but the whole thing was, well, how do you, how do you put in systems to like be prepared to take advantage of either fall downs or things that you hear? And, and I, you know, he said they studied what we do well to put systems behind great moments. And they went to the tape and reflected again. They brought everyone back in. And so, uh, Heather, you mentioned this. He said, number one, we have to be present. We have to listen to the people around us. And then, wh- wh- you know, I can read these off, but if you have them in your notes, uh, Brian, what would he have next? Yeah, so another thing, um, take what you do seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was great. And then, Heather, do you have, or Brian, who wants to read the third one he said there? Keep going. Uh, yes, I had uh, uh, treat everyone individually. Everyone is one of one. They're not one of a hundred, one of a thousand. They're one of one and treat yeah. everybody like they're a unique individual. Yeah. Um, define hospitality, making people feel seen, one size fits, one gestures. And uh, he said repetition matters, uh, which I thought. And so he even hired a new position in the company, a position of uh, dream weaver, I think is what he called it. Mm-hmm. And that position is solely to help others bring their ideas to life. So that's how he's going to scale it and systematize it. Well, hey, it's important. It's going to have a positive ROI. We're going to hire and put someone in there who's going to like curate like the a way to go make ideas <laughs> come to life uh, so that customers can say the word. Awesome. Awesome. He said, we got to bring awesome back to business, which uh, we'll, maybe we'll put that in the title here. Um, so, you know, I thought that was kind of cool to set out to see if they could systematize improv. A restaurant is very much improv. Hospitality is about improv, things that are unexpected. And, and so he said, you know, we use pattern recognition to say to, to like, there are certain events that we know they're going to occur, occur. Like, hey, we're a great restaurant. We might have some people who you know, sometimes get engaged here. So we're going to be prepared for that. And, and so like he, they created this thing called a hospitality toolkit. Heather, what's a hospitality toolkit? Gosh, I have one at Broad River. Um, A hospitality toolkit is all the things that are needed so when those moments happen, you're ready. So you're really intentional about it. So when he talked about engagements, of course, upscale New York City restaurant is going to see its fair share of engagements. And so they partnered with Tiffany & Co. to make sure that, yeah, when you get engaged and we've all been there. It happens. And usually the restaurant brings out champagne, you toast. But after the toast, they would go and they would serve it in these Tiffany champagne flutes. And then they would go and they'd clean them and dry them. And they'd present that blue box to you as a token Mm -hmm. of remembering. So the toolkit provides all those things that you might need on a whim. You might need quick, all of these gestures, but you're a little bit more prepared for the Mm -hmm. gesture, which makes it much more seamless of an experience. Yeah. And you remember like like they have a lot of people who are going off to the air, airport right after they eat. Yeah. And he said, well, that's a touch point. That's a potential for a peak moment. What could we do? So what would they do? Yeah. So they were saying a lot of these people there, this is, might be their last meal or their last stop on the way to the airport. And we've all been there. You're running to the airport and you're rushing. And so a box that's prepared of these snacks and water and things that you might need. You're going through TSA and you're waiting now for your flight. So this little flight package or day one box-esque box of things that you might need, snacks and goods that you would need at the airport. Yeah, it's just such a cool way to take pattern recognition, take peak moments and systematize the deployment of it so that you're left with a a savory, lingering, great experience. Make it an experience worth collecting because people collect experiences. And, and, you know, we're in the business of that as well, like Mm -hmm. furnishing life's best memory. So it's a lot of great inspiration for us. Uh, in, in that, you know, he, he gives the Maya Angelou quote, which who, who wants to kind of riff on that? Uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll botch it here, but it was to the effect of, uh, you know, people won't remember what you say, but to remember how you make them feel. Exactly. So that was their whole inspiration behind kind of, uh, you know, they wanted how to really care about how they made people feel mm-hmm. and not just their customers, but also his own people. And he said, you know, when you look after your people, he said, leadership has evolved. He said, you know, and this goes to what you're talking about earlier, Heather, about people, you know, the purpose. He said people want to be inspired and, uh, and then continue on that. Like, how else did he kind of talk about that topic? Yeah, he talked about impacting others positively. Mm-hmm. One of the things that he really talked about, which took me back to Zach Mercurio years ago when we talked to Zach, is 
why your work matters. Mm -hmm. And so when he would talk to his team, it wasn't just about serving dinner or busting a table, but why is what you do make a difference? Why do you matter? And I think a lot of that and having those open and honest dialogues with your team, I mean, they're there for a reason. They too have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And this gives them the ability to express that purpose and bring more joy to people's lives than they even know is imaginable. Yeah, and and they don't want to just be told what to do. They want to have a seat at the table Mm -hmm. and then be involved in the brainstorming, be involved in the decision making, know that their work matters and and help determine how they're going to get there. And he did all of that. He enrolled the entire team. Uh, You know, he said, you know, going back to the brainstorming, he says, you have to bring the entire team together to brainstorm. Like he, you know, it's everyone. And that's a lot of like, uh, what they talk about lean, right? You go up to the front lines. And, and so they, he was all on the front lines. That's where all the magic, ha- that's where the answers are. He said, this, this one really st- stuck with me. Um, he said, seek the secret to recruiting and retention. This is going back to getting great people is restoring purpose in the work, uh, you know, with generosity, graciousness, and hospitality and, and helping people understand the nobility and service. So in, in doing what you do, you need to help others understand how their work inspires others. So exactly what you're saying. And then we talked about the power of moments and like those magical moments. He, he said he's trying to create magical worlds in a world that needs more magic. And I just love that phrase. I mean, he had a lot of great phrases. Um, hospitality is pursuing relationships with, the, with intention. So nothing was unintentional and creativity. And it will make business businesses more positive and it'll make you feel really good. So where did they end up? Did they stay at in number 50 or where did they, where did they end up, Brian? They did not. No, they ended up at uh, number one. Yeah. Number one. They say so they, they got to number one and, and uh, it's a powerful story. I think they had to, maybe they had to, maybe that's the Netflix show. They had to close and then reopen and deploy all these touch points. And it's, it's a great, um, and, and he won against the guy who'd been number one, you know, the the guy. Well, I think he had finished number two the year before, right? To and lost uh, yeah. uh, an Italian restaurant yeah. uh, in, in Italy. Yeah. Um, and then beat him uh, the next year. Yeah. So I think in 2017 they got to be finally number one, uh, which was setting a great goal, mm-hmm. enrolling the whole team, determining how to systematize some of these, you know, moment operationalize the the peak moments that you want to have, and then just making sure that you work it every single day and and the daily. Uh, the pre-meals and the daily huddles, the daily connections, and just repeating that, and everyone's ro- rowing in the same direction. And 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 so they got there. I think about like Jim Collins and BHAGs, that big, hairy, audacious goal. They got there. And then, you know, we we went into the uh, the Q and A portion. So we'll just riff just for a few more minutes. And he he you know he was asked, how do you scale this? And he said, you know, look, I think with the toolkit and like see where you want to go, and then just kind of work backwards, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so prime the pump first, then trust people to run free. And so the more responsible you give, the more responsibility you give someone, the more responsible they become, which I love that mm-hmm. quote. So it's about trusting your people mm-hmm. and have that bilateral trust there. Another thing he talked about on this repetition piece, he said, someone says, you know, they, I think they asked him something about, you know, how do you get this done? And he never got bored of the pursuit of it was my takeaway. Because he said, have your energy impact others and not the other way around. So sometimes you can, like, the negativity can be a kudzu and can spread and, Mm -hmm. you know, and and what John Gordon calls them the energy vampires or something. He said, no, let your positive energy impact others and not the other way around. So be mindful. And he said, just use that word repetition. He said, look, I did this. I did the pre-meal huddle every day, twice a day for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that's how important it was. He just kind of, you know, I think... That's like acting, thinking long term and acting short term mm-hmm. is is those behaviors. And did you know he worked with Danny Meyer? No, the, the popular restaurateur. No. The, the power of language um, to and, and then the charitable assumption, mm-hmm. um, which I you know Coach Stacy talks about a lot. You know, assume the best in people and ask questions. Don't don't assume the worst. And he got that from Danny, which I thought uh, that was great. Um, he had another saying about. Um, quote unquote, no guest left mm-hmm. behind. I, I thought that was really uh, great. And, and the peak end rule, like we talked about mistakes earlier. He said, mistakes present the best opportunity to recover and gain a fan for life because they're going to remember the last moment, the, the way you leave it. So sometimes we think about, oh, I'll never get this customer again. Uh, we've screwed it up. He's like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. You know, you have this mantra of no guest left behind. 
and you think about the peak end rule, mistakes are an awesome opportunity to go reverse it. And that was a little bit about power of moments goes into that a little bit more, mm-hmm. you know, if, uh, on a scale of one to 10, kind of where they are and how you can kind of really reverse, reverse that. Um, what did you, do you, did you take away about what you talked about being informal with folks? Like when you're trying to connect with a guest? Yeah, I think he said um, it kind of helps take, get their guard down, right? Um, and allows you to be easier to connect with them mm-hmm. um, when you're more informal as opposed to, to formal. Yeah. He said earning it, earning informality. I'd never heard that mm-hmm. phrase before. And, and how? Through presence or, or humor. Mm-hmm. You know, so making them laugh. He said vulnerability, being vulnerable, go from formality to informality. And so I thought that was great when we think about connecting with our guests. You know, just thinking about how do we earn informality, Mm -hmm. uh, which was an intentional phrase they use. And so what being present, using humor, being vulnerable, but you have to earn it. Don't assume that you're there right away. Hey, I'm going to joke around with you. No, have the discernment to know that you got to earn it, which involves being present for it. And you wouldn't expect at a five-star restaurant, you know, he talked about not taking yourself too seriously and you think like, oh. You think that's kind of a serious environment where we're having serious conversations, but how lighthearted it was and how lighthearted he is. Yeah, but but taking the work seriously, mm-hmm. but taking mm-hmm. yourself not as seriously. And then I, I love this thing about um, you know how you get things done. And and Brian mentioned the quote earlier, like at some point you have to say this is important to me. And he said, look, design by committee doesn't work. Brainstorming by committee does work. Uh, but designed by committee, at some point you have to kind of land the plane. And then he had an interesting approach to interviewing and how he hires and finds great people. Do you remember what he talked about there? He talked about, you know, you go into an interview and a lot of times interviews, and we hear this in our world all the time, is is it the right skill set? Is it the right resume? And he really talked about doing things differently. Is this a person I want to spend time with? Are they somebody my team would want to spend time with? Do they use integrity? And so he's really hiring for the person. Hey, if this is somebody I think that I can enjoy their company and I trust, I'm going to bring them in and I'm going to give them a chance. And that's where he's seen a lot of success and bringing people in that kind of are part of the team and help to continue to build the culture. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's some great reasons for very formal interviews and, and processes like that. And he's like, look, I want less structure mm-hmm. and more connection to everything. And I just want to know, do they have integrity? Can I trust them? Will they work hard? I hear, I think about this thing, hire for attitude, mm-hmm. train for aptitude. You know, uh, he, and, and then he also said, will others enjoy working with them because they're coming part of a team? I'm reminded by, it's one of Lynchoni's books, Patrick Lynchoni's books. And maybe it's the motive. I could be way off on that, but he talks about the interview. You got to take them to lunch. You got to see them in informal settings. You got to see how they might act around like the assistant or others, who, you know, who aren't executives and, and make sure that they, uh, you know, don't come off as like pompous or arrogant. And and that's, you know, part of, mm-hmm. you know, are they going to work hard? Are they going to be a team player? Are they going to be part of the team and assimilate well? And are they going to be honest? Can you trust them? Mm-hmm. Once you do like these core things, like the rest kind of takes care of itself, especially in especially in the hospitality industry, but maybe even any industry. So I think there's a lot more here. I'm probably, like you guys, I'm super motivated to go read his book yes, or listen to it, Unreasonable Hospitality, and to watch the Netflix show. And, and then I think we've got to like maybe take some of these ideas and go unpack our touch points. And, and this may be the biggest takeaway that we had from, from World Business Forum. I, mean, I think he was our favorite speaker, probably because we hadn't heard like his content. Like if I'd not heard Jim Collins and I was hearing it for the first time, I probably would have been really mesmerized, mesmerized by it, but I'd never been really interacted with Will Godara. So I'd encourage anyone mm-hmm. who had not read his book or had not watched the Netflix show or, or maybe seen some of the things he said, like to really check him out. Cause there's some powerful stuff there. And I would also kind of say, go, go to like the book, The Motive by Lynn Choney, go to um, uh, you know, The Invisible Leader by Zach Mercurio, go to The Power of Moments by the Heath Brothers. Because I think, I'm guessing Godara was probably inspired mm-hmm. by some of these other writers. Have you ever seen the show The Bear on FX? I have not. No, okay, so, but I've heard great things. Yeah, <laughs> really good. So, but I mean, I had to go check to see if like he was like an executive producer because a lot of things he talked about is what's in the show, right? So like oh. the equivalent of the New York hot dog they're in Chicago. So they got someone in Chicago deep dish pizza yeah. and, you know, 
fancied it up like they would and served it. So uh, I draw a lot of connections between the show and what he was talking about. I couldn't find an con actual connection there, but. Yeah, I, I didn't do any extra research to see how long he worked with Danny Meyer. But, you know, Danny Meyer is really well known for, for you know, the service in, in the restaurant industry and having like kind of maybe done it, been an apprentice or worked with him uh, for many years. I'm sure they you know, were, were learners, were curious, studied a lot of other folks and, and were inspired by them. And, and so I think there's a lot of great learnings and insights for us. So that is our recap on the World Business Forum series from New York City. Heather and Brian, thanks for being here on this episode. Thank you. And uh, check out more of our uh, episodes from this series. Uh, we look forward to bringing you recapping more of the speakers uh, from Stories from the River. Thanks for listening to Stories from the River. To check out more episodes, visit storiesfromtheriver.com. Join us again next week and remember to like, rate, and subscribe to the podcast.